¿Lo conocen de Game of Thrones? ¿De dónde más? Game of Thrones. Iron Fist, ¡Eres Finn Jones! Oh my god, it's Finn! Wow, thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. It's nice to see so many of you. Welcome to Puerto Rico. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you, obviously, for being here with us. Um, and uh, I want to start with something very basic. You've been hanging out in Puerto Rico since Monday. What have you been doing? What do you think about the island, the people? I mean, what's your experience been so, oh, so dude, far? Been I, I've been on like a crash course of the island. So I, um, I, hired a, I, I flew in on Monday and I hired a car straight away. And then um, I just ended up just driving around. So I drove through the north and I stopped. Uh, there's a few beaches up there which I can't remember the name of. Uh -huh. And then I stopped off in Rincon for a couple of nights. I stayed there. Oh. So awesome, so awesome. The beaches there, the, the, the waves, just the vibe, just phenomenal. And then we drove down uh, through Ponce and then up. One thing's beautiful as well. Like the, the south is so gorgeous. Like I took the scenic route, so just all the all the trees. Uh, it was just beautiful. And then um, I drove up into El Yunque, uh, saw some of the rainforest, which I didn't even know were near enough. But... I, I've been living here for 20 years, and I haven't done half that stuff. What? I did it like three days. And then uh, from El Yunque, El Yunque, I drove up. Uh, I went to, oh, what is it, uh, Leos, Leosa? Uh, Louisa. Louisa, yeah, Louisa. that one. So I drove up, back through there, went to a couple of beaches there, and then ended up back in San Juan. And here I am. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, that means, I mean, there's, there's so much in Puerto Rico, you gotta come back. Oh, for sure. Cool. I've been, like, saving places where I need to come back and visit. I want to visit uh, Vieques and Lava oh, as well. Oh, beautiful, man. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we're, gonna, we're doing a, 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 this show in, in Ponce in October, so we hope to have you down there as well. I'd love to come. We'll talk about that after. Well, I, I, I've wanted to come down to Puerto Rico for a long time now, and then when this Comic Con came up, I was just like, fuck yeah. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I've got a lot of friends from Puerto Rico back in New York as well, and honestly, they're some of the nicest people I've ever met, uh, the Puerto Ricans. Like, yeah. very friendly, big hearts, just like super, super chill, and just helpful and welcoming. So, and then, you know, I felt that in New York, and I felt it even more being here. So, very wow. grateful. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for being here. Thank you. So, let's talk shop. Uh, obviously, uh, Game of Thrones, very big deal. Um, <laughs> it's you know, show. You know, a, a little thing called Game of Thrones, yeah. season seven starts up now. Yeah. Um, Did you guys see the new trailer? Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Awesome. That Ice King looks like he's serious, is it? I think there's something to do, like, you know, like, when the, like, they're, they're focusing a lot on the Ice King's eye. And I think, like, there's going to be something to do with, like, maybe it's, like, an all in the mind's eye of the Ice King. Well, there's going to be something trippy like that, I'm well, sure. You think or you know? I think. Is this a I spoiler? Or is this no, no, no. I don't, I don't know anything that's going to happen in the show, but there's just something. I think there's going to be something, like, weird going on with the Ice King. Something, like, otherworldly, you know? So why, why, why do you think Game of Thrones is so popular among so many people? Um, it, it just, it's a good show, you know? People, <laughs> no, but, but it, it's made with real care. Like, people spend time on it. They, they hire the best of the best, people that put their heart into it and, and the best of their skill. And I worked on the show for six years and I certainly felt that everyone that was on that show was at the top of their game and was coming to set every day and bringing all of their passion into the show. And I think it shows. And, and the story is good, the characters are great. Like, it, you know, it starts with great writing and George Martin created yeah. such a great story. Yeah. And then from there, just people's passion and commitment and skill just made it even better. I think one of the things that stand out uh, is the production value. It's like every episode is like a mini movie. You know, it's like seeing Lord of the Rings over and over again. I mean, it's, it's, how, how does the production team, the writers, all these people, um, obviously the support of HBO, uh, put so much effort into creating that experience? I mean, is that something that you feel on set? Yeah, they just allow, um, they allow people to do their thing. And, and I think it really comes from giving people the good budget to create a decent show. 
then also give people time to create it. You know, uh, there's a lot of television shows and a lot of other, you know, films that just want to do stuff as quick as possible on as tight a budget as possible and expect really good results. Whereas HBO are very different from that. They 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 invest in their shows, um, and I think it shows. And what about your character, Floris, Sir Loris, Sir Loris, Tyrell? Um, how how did that come to be? How do you get into that into that character? What do you um, put into that character? Yes. So the uh, character. Yeah. So I mean, as most most of my characters, I like to bring a lot of myself into the role rather than put the role on. And what I found all of my career is when I play roles for longer than six months. A really weird thing happens when, like, the two, like, your own life and the life of the character weirdly seems to merge. And not just in characteristics, but also, like, in experience. Like, certain things start to mirror art, and art starts to mirror life, and it's really, really bizarre. And I don't know how that happens, but it just does. And so, I, I don't know, like, there, there is, there's no kind of, like, getting into character for me. It's, I always uh, just draw on very real experiences, and real characteristics in myself and I just bring them forward and I try to be as open and as vulnerable as I can in the role um, and just allow you know myself just to be seen as best as I can um, um, and, and obviously you know costumes and settings and all that kind of stuff add to it um, but yeah there's not really uh, for me there's not really any kind of method you know I just kind of act on it so yeah, you mentioned the costumes and all that. Do you feel that you, when you put on the costume, do you, I don't know, transform, or do you feel that you're you're a different state of mind? No. I mean, it comes down to really, it comes down to writing. If you've got good writing, it's all there, you know. And if you, and really, you just have to kind of turn up, put the stuff on, and just commit to the words, commit to the reality of the situation. It's all about committing. And um, regardless of what situation you're in, if you just understand the character, understand the, the situation of the scene, and you just play it as truthfully as you can, then all the work just does everything else for you. You know, the camera tells a story, the costumes tell a story, the set tells a story, the other actors help tell a story. So really, you know, there's a danger of doing too much as an actor, especially on television and film. Like, if you try and do too much, it shows, and you kind of begin to overact. Yeah, yeah. So the less you can do, the more you can just trust the situation and believe in the reality of it, I feel the, the truer the performance is. Um, so you've got to have a lot of faith and a lot of trust. So what happens when you invest so much in a character and then they kill, they kill them off? <laughs> that's, that, that's like a Game of Thrones thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, luckily for me, I had six really wonderful years on the show, and I was very happy with the amount of time and the time I had on the show. I, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, I was, it was, it was perfect. You know, I, I went out in a great fashion. I had six really good years and, you know, I jumped ship and I was able to jump onto another ship. So it really worked out perfectly for me. Um, you know, when a character has to die, it has to die. It's, you just hope that you've been given enough time to, to do the character justice. Do you guys know, uh, are you notified when your character is going to die, or is that something that you learn, um, I don't well, know, on set? So with the books, because the books are already written, you, you had an idea of when the character was going to die, mm -hmm. because you go on the books. But with a, a character like mine, I, I had no idea, you know, what the future of Morris would be, because in the books it was open-ended, because he hadn't finished writing the books yet. And so I was just kind of, every season, every new season would come in, I'd flip through scripts to see if I see if I was <laughs> just about yeah. yeah and that's the yeah, um, I mean you know David and Dan the showrunners were you know two awesome showrunners really really um, just intelligent and compassionate uh, and they you know they would call you up before you would get the scripts so they wouldn't kind of just like you know give you a script and make you read yourself like they called me up the night before they sent the scripts around and they just said hey Finn <laughs> this is the phone call, the time has come. And I remember just going, fuck! Because there was a part of me that was like, you know what, just, wouldn't it be great just to see the whole thing through? Just as a, a personal experience, to kind of be there from the very beginning to the very end and just really see through that whole phenomenon. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the time was right and uh, I, I went out and won the
Do you uh, do you miss being on the show? I mean, now that uh, do you know what? <laughs> Next question. I mean, I'm very no. I think it's because I've been so busy with Iron Fist since. Like, so I I, ended, I finished the show in December 2015. I think it was 15. December 2015, and then I started Iron Fist in March 2016. So I only had three months, and that was like Christmas anyway. So you know, and then I was straight into another show, and like Iron Fist, the Bendis is just go 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 go. go, go, go. So, I had no time, I've had no time to kind of reminisce or miss it. I'm sure when the show comes back out and I'm starting to watch it again, I'm going to see my buddies on screen and be like, oh, I really miss, I miss you guys. Like, I wish I was in Ireland right now and I was, I was doing that. But like I said, I had, a, I had six really great years and, and um, you know, I just, I think very fond of I want, I want to go back to something you mentioned about the writing. Uh, obviously, you know, George R. R. Martin, R. R. Martin is an incredible writer. Um, yeah. Is he involved at all uh, when you guys are shooting and, and does he like pick your brain? Or um, so he was very involved in the first season. He was around a lot. Um, I met him several times. He's super, super friendly. You know, always, always got a smile on his face, always willing to listen. Um, but then after the first season, he kind of, he wasn't around as much. I think he was, he was around with the writers and the showrunners, but he just wasn't on set as much as he was in the first season. I don't think that was, you know, he was just giving the show the space it needed to breathe and do their own thing. He trusted David and Dan to do a good job, and they have done. And so, um, and you know, George is a busy guy. He's, he's yeah, got a couple yeah. more books to write. Definitely. You know, he's got a life to live. So. Yeah. Um, Game of Thrones, obviously, you know, a lot of revenge stories. Uh, why do you think that type of storyline is so appealing? I don't think it's just, I don't think Thrones is just about revenge. I think it's, it's about a lot of different things. Um, why do people like revenge stories? Or at least that theme, I mean, that's all. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not really a vengeful person, so I, I'm actually not someone that does like revenge stories. I, I prefer stories of struggle and, and, and compassion and hope. That's why I like uh, Star Wars so much, because there's, you know, there's, there's so much hope in those films, but also you understand the struggle, you know? And I'm, I'm really into taking, I, I like taking flawed characters and, letting them go through the shit, kind of adapting to stronger, more independent people. Right. Like that, for me, those are, those are more interesting stories than just, someone screwed you over, so I've got to go and take revenge. It's like, it's just, it's just a bit basic, you know? Yeah. But, um, yeah, this is my, my opinion. All right. Um, obviously, you already mentioned Iron Fist. Let's talk about that transition. I mean, it, it seems like one end of the spectrum to the other. You know, you go from, you know, a classic story to a Marvel superhero. Yeah. How did that come about? Were you interested from the beginning? Um, I mean, how, how did that whole process come to be? So the process of that was quite a serendipitous one. I was, um, I was last day of filming Game of Thrones. I was in the airport on the way home, and I was sitting there. And I was thinking, God, this is the first time in six years that I'm not going to have a stable job, and it was the first time that I was going to be an out of work actor. It was pretty terrifying to me. Um, and I was sitting there and I was thinking, God, what's next? You know, I'm really into making breaks now. Because, you know, Game of Thrones was great, but it was a guest role. So I really wanted to see myself being uh, a lead or a supporting lead. And um, I was in the airport and I was going through my phone and I get this email and the audition for Iron Fist comes, comes through on the email. I open it and I'm like, oh, okay, what's this? And as I start to read the character breakdown, the more I read it, the more I just get this heavy feeling in my heart that it was just, this was going to be the one. You know, sometimes in life things just happen and you just know, you just have that instinct, you're just like, this is it, this, this is it. And it was about, uh, about a month, month and a half process of me auditioning. I first sent off self-tapes, uh, so I recorded this self-tape back in London and then I sent it off to LA and then in January I found myself in LA and I was going to go there anyway just for pilot season and, you know, just to audition. And the first audition I got when I was back there was a recall for Iron Fist. So I had that recall just with the cast director and then she told me there in the room, she was like, Finn, I shouldn't be saying this, but you're the favourite. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. That, yeah. When someone says something like that, it kind of just makes you, you realise that it's within your reach, you know? Because you do audition after audition after audition. And most of the time you're just doing it because it's there. But when someone says to you, 
no, you've got a real shot, you're like, oh, all right, okay, cool, right. Story, yeah. let's, let's, you know, you, you just focus in a lot more. <laughs> and so then the next week I met up with all the producers, the writers, directors, Netflix, Marvel, and then I did two screen tests. I did a, uh, one screen test on my own, and I did another screen test with a female actress for like chemistry. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, and then about it was about a three week period in LA, and I eventually uh, got, the, got the role. So you saw the script and uh, the Danny Rand character. Well, I didn't see the script. Oh, you didn't. Okay. No. But what, what jumped out at you uh, when, when you saw? The other I like the fact that he wasn't the typical. Superhero. In fact, he isn't. I mean, the Danny we've seen in season one, he isn't a superhero yet. He's a vulnerable, flawed young individual that is caught between very opposing worlds and forces. You know, on the one hand, he is he is a child that has suffered immense trauma, and he has been outside of his world for 15 years, and he is vulnerable. He is alone, and he is fucked up. He has a lot of issues. You know, Beep. <laughs> sorry. Not sorry. You know, and, and he's 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 irresponsible. He's reckless. But on the other hand, he is in this situation where he is a warrior, and he has this responsibility, and you, you know, he, he has this spiritual foundation. But then also, he has this foundation which is from a, a hugely capitalist and and uh, privileged background. So he's constantly trying to juggle these two worlds, and season one of Iron Fist is Danny trying to work out where he lands and what to do with his responsibility and what it all means. Like he is not fully formed, and that really interested me—the fact that he wasn't going to be a fully formed superhero, that I wasn't just going to be playing someone who just turns up in spandex and can save the day. The fact that he gets the girls. No, yeah, no, exactly. No, he doesn't get the girls. Well, he does get the girls, but like. <laughs> <laughs> but he, you know, he's flawed, and that really excited me to have a character that I can start. That's a very flawed character. Be careful, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> a very flawed character, but then over years and time, transition him into right. yes. Iron Fist, the superhero. Yeah. And it's really interesting, you know, moving towards Defenders and seeing where Danny ends up in Defenders compared to where we first see him in Iron Fist. And just to see that arc in those first like uh, it's like 21 episodes, it's really it's really interesting. And it's, it's a lot as an actor, it's a lot of fun to be able to take the slow, more organic route of character development. All right, so I'm excited because you've mentioned Defenders a few times already, and you got to tell me, tell me something, tell us something about I mean, the what Defenders. Do you want to know? <laughs> I mean, what, what can you say without you know breaking and I, like I, I, I find it difficult. Kind of keep well, it's the rules. No, I mean, what could so when someone tells me not to do stuff, I usually do it. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, I know Marvel will have snipers on me at all times. So I know if I say something too extreme, they will shoot me dead right now on the spot. <laughs> all right, great. I've got someone to take a bullet. Let's go. <laughs> so, uh, so let me let me see. Uh, it's eight episodes, and it takes place over a very short amount of time. So I think it maybe takes place over like 48 hours, maybe, or maybe a bit more than that, so it's got this real frenetic, fast-paced energy to it. Um, and the heroes, it, they don't, it's not kind of like they all team to, like they don't want to be together, you know, they're reluctant to join forces. Their backs are up against the wall and they have to fight together because they've got no other choice. So you kind of take it from there, you know. This isn't some kind of buddy movie where we all team up, kind of, you know, singing Ring of Ring of Roses and, yeah, yeah. you know, kissing each other on the lips. You know, there's, there's a lot of tension within the group. And through that tension, we actually find friendship and allies. And it's a very, it just has a very real uh, tone to it. Are, are you excited about the, the, the Defenders? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, with most of my work, I'm excited when I do it, like I film it, I put my heart and soul into it, but then once you've done it, you kind of got to distance yourself from it, because you don't, you can't control what comes out the other end, and because, you know, you don't know who, how people are going to edit it, what takes they're going to choose, like all of this kind of stuff, yeah. so while I'm excited for you guys to see it, I, you know, I've done my work now, and that's part of the journey over, I'm looking forward to the next thing, you know. All right. So with with uh, obviously Iron Fist Defenders, you've made this transition from um, 
mega network like HBO to Netflix. And Netflix is obviously, you know, the small guy that's disrupting the industry. You know, they got, uh, you know, obviously Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, and all these other programs that are, I guess, sort of a thorn in, in the industry side. Um, difference uh, under the wing of HBO versus now with Netflix? They're two really great companies, and they're great companies because of this, because they allow artists, showrunners, writers, directors, actors, they allow those people that are creating content for their channels to be free. You know, it's not like network television where, you know, you have adverts, so you have, you know, you've got, you know it's, a, it's, a, it's a corporation thing, it's a money thing. You have to tick certain boxes. Whereas companies like HBO and Netflix, they're subscription-based. So there's a lot more creative and artistic freedom. And certainly working with Netflix, you, you know, they, they allow. They allow and they take risks. And what do you think they're focusing on these, like you mentioned earlier, these non-traditional superhero characters? Because um, uh, I think they're interesting. Yeah. I think they're, you know, A, they can probably get the rights to them. <laughs> you probably can't yeah, get the rights true. to Spider-Man and Captain America and all that lot because, you know, true. they're doing their movie thing. Yeah. Um, but they're, you know, they're, they're interesting street level superheroes that aren't, they're flawed superheroes, they're reluctant superheroes. And that's the story that Marvel Television and Netflix wanted to tell. They didn't want to tell a story of a perfect movie star <laughs> superheroes. Yeah. They wanted to tell gritty street level stories. And so I think they chose these heroes because they all have elements in them which are gritty and real and down to earth. Okay. Um, and, and within that universe, um, on, on the small screen, we're seeing a lot of uh, crossover episodes. You know, you, we see it in Arrow, we see it in, in, in all these channels. Um, and now we're seeing it in, in Defenders. Is, is, why do you think that's... What do you feel with those crossover well, it's, 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 it's simply what Netflix and Marvel Television are doing now, is they're bringing the comic book format to life. It's always been this way, you know, back in the 70s when the comic books were out, Comic books have been doing this the whole time. Like people have been crossing into other comic books, and you, you know, there's been that crossover. And now, thanks to Netflix, we now have the freedom of platform to do that. Like, when have you ever seen in television, like, a character get 13 episodes of just their story, of their character build up, before you then go to the main event and start telling the crossover story? Like, you allow such character development in those stories, something that network television and especially films you can't do because you simply don't have the, 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 the film in time. Um, so it's exciting, it's, it's really it's exciting as a, as a platform and as a, as a creative choice to kind of go in that direction. So now, you're, you're now obviously Iron Fist, you got Defenders coming up, what's next? What, where, where can you tell us that Finn Jones is, where, where can we see Finn Jones next? <laughs> one, one project at a time, yeah. Um, I don't know, man. Like, so I've just been filming con like solid for a year with Iron Fist and Defenders, and then I went straight into a, a world tour for Iron Fist, and now I'm about to go straight into a world tour for Defenders, and then hopefully, fingers crossed, I'll go straight into season two for Iron Fist. Yeah. So, um, we should be hearing a confirmation within the next month or so if that's going ahead, which I'm hopeful. Um, yeah. And so really, right now, my focus is just on bringing this character life as best as I can. Um, hopefully after the World Tour of Defenders, I'm going to have like four or five months to really just train myself, prepare myself for season two. And so I'm just committing to this role right now. Um, and I'm not, in a, I'm not in a hurry, I'm not in a rush, I'm 29. Um, hopefully I'll be playing Danny Rand for a couple more years to come. Yes. And then by the time Danny Rand has finished his chapter, maybe I'll be like 34, 33. And then I'll be developed into a, a different person to take on another role. So I really, yeah. you know, I'm, I, I don't like to kind of, I like to kind of be present and, and work on what I've got, rather than chase around and always want more, 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 you know? Yeah. Um, you know, when I see these ensemble casts and they do interviews and whatnot, they always talk about chemistry and how great they get along and all that stuff. Is, is, is that the case with the, the Defenders? Uh, oh, yeah. Sure. With uh, Luke Cage and yeah. Jessica Jones and all those guys? Yeah, yeah. It's, it was kind of actually unbelievable how well we all got on uh -huh. straight off the bat. Okay. And I think it comes from the fact that we all have led our own individual show and we all know 
what it's like. We all, we all, we all have experienced the successes, but we've also experienced the frustrations and the uh, kind of annoyances that come with it as well. You know, so when we when we see each other, we we understand what each one has been through, and that kind of allows it to be like a level playing field. And and luckily, you know, uh, Kristen, Mike, Charlie. They're all really humble, down-to-earth, talented, generous, and caring actors, and we all supported each other. We all had a, we had such a good time, a great laugh working together, and um, yeah, and I'm, I'm being genuine now. I'm not just hyping this up because I'm trying to sell a TV show. I tell you, I hate them. I don't. I fucking love them. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I just really hope we get to work with each other all again because we had such a blast. Yeah. You don't do a lot of Comic Cons, um, and obviously we're very grateful that you came to Puerto Rico here. Uh, why do you think this type of event uh, is so hugely popular around the world in cities like San Diego, New York, Phoenix, and, and all that? I've been doing Comic Cons for about six years now, mm -hmm. and obviously it's a place where people can come and meet actors, meet comic book writers, all this kind of stuff. But I think essentially why people come here, why they're so special, is it allows people to come to these events free from judgment and be fans of whatever they're into. You guys can be yourself. If you want to come and dress as a uniform, you can. No one's going to judge you guys. And for me, that's why I love Comic Con so much. It's because people are just being freaky, they're being weird, they're, they're being awesome. And no one else is judging them for that. And I, I really dig, I really dig that kind of energy and that, that vibe. And that's why I do Comic Cons, and that's why I enjoy coming to these things. Great. Well, listen, I want to thank you. I know you're tight on time. You want to go back down and uh, continue with the autographs and the photo ops and stuff. So um, I'll let you go. And I, once again, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, un aplauso bien fuerte para el gran Pink Kong.